police uh, present because they're afraid that the police are going to try and influence the elections. We can't have that. That's a no-go. I mean, who's making this stuff up? Some of these stories that you see out there, you're like, really? Really? Is that what's going on? But the story that we are going to talk about is the military and police in Washington state prepare for possible civil unrest after the election. Now, we've already got some more flames, some more sparks stoking the flames, whatever that term is. And that's what we're going to start with. We're going to start with what's going on in Philadelphia. So if you haven't followed this story, on Monday, we had a mentally, a, some, a person with mental problems who's on medication out in the street with a knife. His mom's trying to chase him down. He's aggressively going after the police. He won't put the knife down. He gets shot and killed. Philadelphia is erupting in violence. So this is kind of a predecessor, I'm thinking, leading up. And you're just going to see more and more of this stuff right through next Tuesday. That's what I think happens. So if you haven't followed this story, this is what's going on. Violence tears through West Philly after police shoot and kill a man. 30 officers are hurt. And when you hear how one of these, these uh, it's a female sergeant, I think she's like 57, how she gets hurt, it's brutal. The violence happened after police shot and killed Walter Wallace Jr., who was seen on video armed with a knife, according to police, as his mother tried to restrain him Monday. Let's talk about that for just a second. Could you imagine being a parent restraining your kid who you know has mental issues? Maybe your kid is a big dude and he's coming after police with a knife. You know this isn't going well, but you're like, oh my gosh, I cannot help this. So what are the police supposed to do? Are they supposed to just go, oh, let's just let this guy run around with a knife? No, they got that their job is to protect society. And if there's one guy that's not having a good day, who's off his meds, on his meds, whatever. I don't know. You got to take care of that scenario. And they did. And unfortunately, that person died. And that is horrible. However, what is the alternative? Let that guy go. I've kind of been changing my mind about what we've got going on in here in Seattle. And that is basically not to have police respond to 911 calls, but some social workers. And I am for the whole social worker thing now. I want to send out a social worker. Don't send any armed police. Send out a social worker on every 911 call, and let's see how that works out. How do you think that would work out in this case, where you've got a guy with a knife, he's on the streets, he's kind of running loose. Let's send some social workers out. Let's see how that goes. What's going to happen? Social workers, they're going to get stabbed. They're going to get killed. And after like six months of this, can you imagine anybody wanting to volunteer to be a social worker, handle the 911 calls? No, you don't. I don't have a problem with 911 calls. You take out a social worker and a cop, but let's be honest, you can't do much else. You need an armed person because if this guy with a knife kills other people on the street, who are we going to blame? I don't know. But now we're blaming the cops for doing their job. That's the bottom line. That sucks. All right, crowds of people took to the streets in West Philadelphia overnight after Philadelphia police officers shot and killed Walter Wallace Jr., a man armed with a knife Monday. At least 30 officers were hurt responding to the crowds and 91 people were arrested. I've been following some of the video. These guys are so brazen. They are running into buildings, coming out with big bags, putting them into their cars. And on the video, you have got the license plates of these cars. And these knuckleheads are not even wearing masks. The one time you can wear a mask and hide your identity, live in fear, hide your identity, wear a mask, they're not doing it. It's just, it baffles me. But, you know, breaking into a store and looting based on police doing their job, that's another thing as well. All right, so yeah, your, your social worker police force won't last long. I totally agree. Yeah, no, send the social workers in. That's what we're talking about doing. We have already defunded the police to the extent that the homeless uh, outreach from the police is gone. And homeless, if you follow any of my podcast, they're overrunning the city. They're overrunning parks. It is crazy. It's wild. And I don't see any complaints about feedback, so I am guessing that we are okay. If the audio is off, let me know. We tried to correct that, but I think we have. 
All right. So angry crowds took to the streets in West Philadelphia overnight. This is on Monday night. Uh, after police shot and killed a man armed with a knife, uh, some in the crowds throwing rocks and bricks at police and some looting or vandalizing businesses. At least 30 police officers were hurt, police said. One was hospitalized, a 56-year-old sergeant who was intentionally run over by a pickup truck at 52nd and Walnut Street early Tuesday. Philadelphia Police Commissioner Daniel Outlaw said uh, her leg was broken, among other injuries. She is lucky to be alive got run over by a truck. I don't even care if it's a small truck. Oh, that's horrible. Any regular truck, you're coming away with a broken leg. Man, that is fortunate. All the officers except for the one struck by the truck have been treated and released as of early Tuesday. But you're not really seeing that in the media much, are you? No. No, the peaceful protesters are just out doing their thing. All right, so um, at least one police car and dumpsters were set on fire as police struggled to contain the crowds. More than a dozen, dozen officers, many with batons in hand, formed a line as they ran down 52nd Street, chasing protesters away from the main thoroughfare. Police said eight ve uh, vehicles and one fire department vehicle were vandalized. At least 91 people were arrested. All right, so you've got that going on Monday night. Yeah, looters seized on the night of unrest, multiple stores are broken into, a restaurant, um, and people going in out of a beauty supply store. They're taking their stuff. All right, let's move on to the next one. That is National Guard deployed to Philadelphia. And I think this is a run-up to what we're going to see on Tuesday. This stuff isn't going to go away between now and next Tuesday, and I'm referencing the uh, election. Governor Tom Wolf ordered soldiers to the city in anticipation of a second night of violent riots over deadly cop shooting. And um, the Pennsylvania National Guard was deployed to Philadelphia Tuesday as the city braces for a second night of violent riots after tense confrontations between angry demonstrators and police hours after two officers shot and killed a black man. Several hundred guardsmen will assist local agencies in protecting life, property, and the right to peacefully assemble and protest. And guess what? They went for it again last night. Last night was Tuesday night. The, um, they just kind of, they just went hard. That's what they're doing in Philadelphia. They're upset for the police doing their job. And I, I get the whole um, issue that they feel they've been per persecuted as far as black feel they've been persecuted just by police in general. But these are situations now that that are not supporting the whole Black Lives Matter issue, are they? A cop is basically just doing their job, trying to keep the, the streets safe, and the cops get blamed for this, and now we have looting. That is where we're at. And I think either way, after the election, either way this election goes, you're going to have some looting. Looting is going to happen. And how will we justify this as the peaceful protesters? That is... Um, it was a really big lifted Dodge with bigger tires. That sucks. That's a big truck. Mm. Imagine that have run over you. You're doing your job and somebody comes up and just runs over your legs. Ugh. Just crazy. It's a crazy time. So I'm not going to read too much more of that. But what we are going to do is we're going to, you know what? <laughs> Here's another thing. Get this. This is, this is the craziness that is in Seattle. And I should say thank you all for tuning in. And everybody who's subscribed, it has been awesome. It's been, it's been an awesome run since CHOP. I've had to kind of transition uh, from going to co covering CHOP to kind of doing a couple of daily podcasts here in studio. And um, that has really picked up. Thank you all for joining. Thank you for tuning in. Sharing my content is the best thing you can do because I'm getting censored, censored left and right. And sometimes and people are pointing out, hey, you're just being demonetized. But when you get demonetized, YouTube doesn't want to push out your content. So if you guys can share, that would be awesome. But more importantly, I have to thank the city of Seattle because day in and day out, you guys are providing me such amazing content that people from all over the world are tuning in and going, what is the train wreck happening in Seattle? Here's another little tidbit. So, so thank you to our governor. Thank you to our city mayor. Thank you to every single one of our council members because you guys provide the content right now that makes this podcast kind of entertaining, I think. I look at it sometimes and go, huh, those are some wacky stories. Why is a real estate guy covering wacky stories? Because it's happening. 
and it's happening in Seattle, not just happening here, it's happening all over the US in certain cities, certain leadership. So I'm thanking that leadership right now because I'm covering it. That's what we're doing. So here's, before I move on to the guts of this, of the story, here is what is going on in Seattle. I know people are questioning our, the whole uh, social worker things. Thank Karl Marx. <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah, that is funny. Uh, but no, seriously, the Seattle, um, our leadership wants to basically abolish the police and put in a system of social workers. Good luck with that. That's all you can say there. I mean, it's, just, it's so inconceivable. Here's something else. This is from Cairo 7, and this is an article, and I'm not going to spend any time on this, really, because I'm going to do a whole nother on this. Critic says a poverty defense would prevent misdemeanor prosecutions in Seattle. So here is last week during a budget discussion by our Seattle City Council, Herbold, City of Seattle uh, Council member, brought up a proposal drafted by advocacy groups to allow people accused of misdemeanors, crime, people accused of crime, to show a judge or jury how their poverty, substance abuse, or mental illness led them to act, and then they will get out of these crimes. Literally, that came up in a council meeting, and this is, what, this is the kind of lunacy that you've got going on in Seattle. So if you can prove that your poverty, that you're poor, that you have a substance abuse issue, a mental illness, or maybe all three, two out of three, all you got to have is one of those with this proposal. And that crime you did, you, you vandalized a car, you broke something, you robbed, whatever, misdemeanor, because everything kind of gets set in a misdemeanor here in Seattle. None of it gets prosecuted. But now, if you can prove poverty, oh, man, I am really poor. Can you let me out? Yep. Yeah, sorry for the inter interruption to your life. Poverty, substance abuse, or mental illness. Guess what that does? That clears the docket all day long. Also creates a massive issue for crime. You are basically rewriting criminal law in Seattle. That's what's going on. And this story is even getting picked up kind of by some ma major media. People are like, what are you guys doing? And most of the time, we, we know what I say about what we're doing in Seattle? We're doing nothing. We're just letting things go, kind of summer love. Let her rip. Let it happen until it doesn't happen or until the social workers get killed, maimed, quit, and then we don't have a social worker force. And then we're like, oh, yeah, I guess the police weren't that bad. They, they held law and order better here in Seattle than the social workers. Uh, social workers, they, they can't really control any situations. They can't really make this work. What were we thinking? That's what's going to happen in Seattle. And that's what's going to happen across a bunch of other cities in the United States as well. Watch and, watch and see. It will happen. This is crazy. So, yeah, that's happening. Um, and why, as a real estate guy, why do I cover this? Because when you have property in an area that basically only has social worker coverage, guess what's going to happen? That's not going to do well. Long term, that is a no-go. We are really struggling with listings right now in Seattle due to the coronavirus of studios and one bedrooms. And I say this over and over and over. It's because nobody wants to hunker down and um, self-isolate or whatever in a tiny little studio, a 350-square-foot uh, studio, or a one bedroom. It's just a pain in the rear. And all the stuff that's open in areas or normally is open in areas where you've got a lot of condos, kind of the downtown areas, Nobody's doing that. Nobody's going out. I think there was a little surge early, but most people, and it's mostly only young people that are out and about. So these condos are difficult to sell at the least. And in those areas, you got Seattle police no longer really covering anything. The other areas that are going to be really hurt are the low income areas because you're not going to have police coverage anymore. You've already got high crime rates in those areas. So our society's People who need the most help, they are going to be impacted the most. And guess what? Their voices won't be heard. And this will be a social experiment, experiment that has gone wildly sideways. And who will we blame? Do we blame the police? Do we blame the leadership? I don't know. But I'm going to keep talking about it until something changes. Because guess what? People are like, 
why is only a real estate guy and a few other people really talking about this? The train wreck that is Seattle. And it's not just Seattle. It's a bunch of other cities as well. You can just pick up the newspaper. When I say pick up the newspaper, I mean your phone on your digital news app. Sometimes I just give myself away because I used to actually pick up a newspaper. I still look at it in 7-Eleven when I get, like, I'll get like a bag of chips and a Perrier or a Diet Coke, some, you know, ridiculous snack I don't need, but I want the break. I will do that and I will look at the headlines on the newspaper because that makes me feel good that I'm still tied to a news system of yesteryear. But that's it. So we're going we're gonna to head over to the main guts, and that is post-election. What do you guys think that will look like? Do you think it'll just be calm and the peaceful protesters will just kind of, oh, the election's over. I guess, we put our, I guess we put our shields and our umbrellas with the sharpened handles, and I guess we'll put our riot gear away. That was a fun run. No. That is not happening, and everybody knows it. Military police in Washington state prepare for possible civil unrest after election. I love possible, possible civil, uh, um, and you guys are talking about Sawant, our genius Marxist socialist uh, city council member. We've, we've just got some real nut jobs in our city council. They were elected there, though, so, you know, when you can't really get too upset. When you elect these people and these people are known for doing this stuff, guess what happens? That This is what happens. And so you've just got this craziness going on in Seattle and headline after headline after headline. It just makes my job so easy, right? All right, let's keep going. As tensions build toward Election Day, law enforcement officials in Washington and elsewhere are preparing for the prospect that this year's long, hot summer of unrest won't end on November 3rd, regardless of who wins the presidency. And this is a Seattle Times article. They have some pretty good coverage. It's, it's biased, but um, I can live with it. And sometimes they get an article that I think, all right, you got enough of the facts right. I'll, I'll read it. If anything, officials worry that pro the pressure will only build in the coming weeks, faced with the possibility of a contested election, spiking gun sales, and ongoing civil unrest over institutional racism and police violence, all driven by a tsunami of social media misinformation and conspiracies from the right and left, not to mention from foreign adversaries. We've got all this going on, don't we? Iran chipping in, China chipping in, Russia, we've got Russiagate, Russiagate 2.0 happening again. Russia is gonna influence our elections. I mean, that's just happening, right? London strolling. Interesting. Um, I can say, thank you. Uh, I can say that we have no specific credible threats at this time, said Joshua Murphy, the assistant special agent in charge of the Seattle office of the FBI, where he oversees counterintelligence. So no specific credible threats at this time, but we're still training anyway. We're not going to outline anything, but we know it's coming. And I think everybody else knows it's coming, but everybody's kind of like, you know, after the election, I'm not so sure how this will go. Everybody just kind of wants to ignore this stuff and go on with their life because there's not a lot you can do about it other than cast your vote and then let the chips fall where they do. And then we got to deal with it. But I really believe we're going to have some craziness after the election. If I'm wrong, hey, great. If, if things are calm and peaceful, that's awesome. I don't think there is a chance of that happening. Um, and this is uh, the last comments that from Joshua Murphy. He ran the Joint Terrorism Task Force, and he's saying, well, right now we don't have any threats, but we could, so here's what we're doing. Even so, federal, state, and local officials have participated in tabletop exercises outlining possible scenarios for post-election violence and mayhem. Tabletop, meaning they are not physically out there doing they're not running through the streets of Seattle right now doing physical training, but they are, they're planning because we kind of know all the areas, most all the cities that are getting uh, ripped apart by these um, peaceful protests, everybody knows where they hit. They know how it happens. We had a protest this last weekend in my town here in Bellevue, a suburb of Seattle, and our police dialed that baby in. Our police kind of just kept right on them and they were aware this was gonna happen. They found some weapons. And by weapons, I mean some rocks and a couple of propane tanks. Did a 
podcast on that. I did that already release. I think it did. Um, but the police here did a great job. And I think everybody's kind of aware. All right, this is going to happen. So it'll be really interesting to see how the tabletop preparations go for what's going to what I think happen. At least 300 National Guard soldiers recently deployed overseas are being trained to handle civil unrest. They will be placed on alert with hundreds of other Guard members who have already been trained for handling such disturbances. Police leaders in Seattle, which has hosted some of the country's largest racial justice protests, have canceled time off for officers. All right, so you've got the National Guard training, you've got Seattle police, same thing that happened at CHOP. You talk to the cops at CHOP. Yeah, we know it's going down this Saturday. I had vacation time scheduled. It got wiped out. I got the memo. I got the text. You guys are in. Nobody has any time off. And especially with, I don't know if you've seen, Seattle Police Department is down. I think it was 118 officers so far in 2020. I'm sure that's closer to 130 who knows, maybe it's 140, got a lot of blue flu going on, can't blame them. Take that uh, vacation time before you check out and go, go someplace that people appreciate your service. Got some blue flu going on. And then just last month in September, we had 39 police officers say, bye bye, Seattle, I got to move on to greener pastures. That's what's going on. So you've got in the, the uh, interim Seattle Police Chief Diaz, he came right out and said, yeah, we are short on officers. We don't have enough officers to cover the streets of Seattle. We can't keep Seattle safe. That's, that's where we're at. And you want to defund these guys even further, and you want to send out some social workers. That's what we're doing. Genius. Given the atmospherics and the civil unrest this summer since the May riots, we've focused and increased our resources, said Murphy. Agents anticipate more un un unrest like that scene in the aftermath of the mass protests that sprang up in the wake of the May 25th video recorded death of George Floyd while handcuffed and restrained by Minneapolis police. So the worst of those protests took place May 31st. And then they have happened intermittently after that. But, you know, nightly in Portland for, what, 150 nights? Here in Seattle, I think they just celebrated their 150th night of going out and making their point by looting and stealing and a little graffiti, property destruction, breaking into people's businesses. That's how they're getting their point across. And our government just kind of, our local government here in Seattle just sits around and goes, uh, yeah, that's what we're doing. So um, on one of the most chaotic days, thousands of mostly peaceful protesters gathered in downtown Seattle on May 30th in support of Black Lives Matter, but some in the crowd looted stores and vandalized buildings. Federal prosecutors have charged a handful of individuals for burning police cars and gun-related charges, including stealing police firearms from patrol cars. So those guys are getting prosecuted. Here in, in uh, Bellevue, I think we have... 70 people that we are prosecuting uh, for the, those riots that happened May 31st. They basically broke into our downtown area, Bellevue Square, and um, our police department has committed through 2021 to prosecute those people, send them to jail, put them away. In June, Seattle police temporarily abandoned the East Precinct on the face of nightly protests on Capitol Hill and downtown because our civic leaders didn't back the police. They, the police were just basically, we're out, we're out of here. We're not trying to hold this office down, which drew criticism from President Donald Trump. He criticized the kind of the whole thing, who threatened to send in federal troops and is referred to Seattle as an anarchist jurisdiction. Have you guys followed this one? So White House basically said, Portland, Seattle, New York City, you guys are anarchist jurisdictions. Jurisdictions. We may withhold some of your federal funding because you guys promote anarchy. That's what you got going on. So all three of those cities have now basically sued federal government for this anarchist jurisdiction. It's a bunch of politics. I don't think anything's going to happen of it one way or the other. But they've kind of sure been put on notice, haven't they? Everybody's like, oh, anarchy. That is not a good label. Not a good label for a city. But if you read the definition of anarchy, yeah, that's kind of what we've got going on here in Seattle and Portland and New York City in certain, certain areas. You've got that going on. Seattle Police Department says dozens of officers have been injured during the protests, often by rocks 
fireworks and thrown water bottles. Here's the thing about the water bottles. They are filled with water and they are frozen. Get hit in the head with a frozen water bottle that's, you know, pretty good size. Mm, that will leave a mark. That is crazy. The department has been criticized for using excessive force against peaceful demonstrators. Why do we have excessive force being used on the peaceful demonstrators? Because they're not peaceful. Simple as that. They're doing stuff they shouldn't be doing. The racial justi uh, justice protests have also have drawn the attention of armed opponents from the other end of the ideological spectrum. Right-wing groups such as the Proud Boys and Patriot Prayer, some with white supremacist agendas and often heavily armed, have organized counter demonstrations to support law enforcement. The tensions between the two can be observed in almost nightly clashes in Portland, where hundreds has been arrested and a Patriot Prayer supporter was killed. I did a podcast on that, too, and that was a brutal deal. Um, federal agents and police killed the suspect, a self-proclaimed anti-fascist, in a controversial shooting outside an apartment in Thurston County. That's also here in the state of Washington. So the killing happened down in Portland, and then a killer ran. He's a Antifa guy. He ran to uh, southern Washington County, Thurston County, and they had a little bit of a shootout, and it did not end well for him. While many states are concerned about voter intimidation, experts who monitor extremist activity say they're less concerned about that here, given that the state's residents vote by mail, said uh, Devin Burgart, the Seattle-based board president of something. Voting by mail generally reduces or eliminates polling places that extremists can target, he said. But extremist chatter about post-election unrest is intensifying in this state, Burgart said. There have been a number of groups in Washington who've been talking about the likelihood of a civil war if the elections don't go the way they want, Burkhart said. A lot of people are talking about civil war. I don't know. That seems far-fetched. That seems extreme. But when you've got riots going on like this, I mean, another couple of steps up, you're not far from that. And you've got this widespread social unrest and these people just running through the streets who are supposedly peaceful protesters. They're just running through the, the streets and just tear things apart. That's what they're doing. And the rest of us just kind of sit back and go, huh, what is the deal there? Burghardt said his group has observed an increase in apocalyptic rhetoric from members of People's Rights, a paramilitary group founded by anti-government activist Amon Bundy. He's the dude who led the armed occupation of the federal Malheur National Wildlife Refuge in Oregon in 2016. There's always some guy down in Oregon on a big, huge acreage spread in eastern Oregon where it's kind of just, it's like Wyoming, and they hole up on top of a mountain or whatever and just kind of, this is our land, we'll do what we want. F off to everybody. There's always somebody doing that in Portland. Uh, not in Portland, but in Oregon. It's just kind of one of those Wild West states. With chapters in at least 15 states and a purport, and Idaho is right in there too. Idaho. Man, that has just been white supremacist for a long time. With chapters in at least 15 states and a purported membership of 26,000, the Idaho-based extremist group's largest stronghold is in Washington State, Burghardt said. Do you see how this article has gone to the far right? We're focusing on the far right, even though they're not the ones out in the streets looting on a regular basis. They're just not. They're not, they're not the ones doing that. In the months leading up to the election, people's rights and other far right groups have fomented hostility toward COVID-19 restrictions in Washington and elsewhere by staging rallies and other events. But they're not breaking into businesses and looting them, are they? They're staging rallies. Who was it that I was watching yes yesterday? It was some hip hop artist who was really wigged out. Cardi B, Cardi B, she has the, the WAP song. Uh, so Cardi B is in her car in LA, the streets of LA, and there's a bunch of pro-Trump rallies going on. She's like scared, she's afraid. And these guys are just driving by with flags. They're not looting, they're not being violent. They're just waving an American flag. And she gets all worked up. She's just so worked up over this whole thing. When I get worked up is when I see people breaking into stores and kind of running down the street 
when I see cars that have been firebombed. That happened here in Bellevue on May 31st, and I, I was there and took a bunch of footage. That was a mess. It was a mess. Murphy at the FBI declined to discuss specific groups. However, he acknowledges that the period between the vote and the determination of the winner is a period that will be fraught with uncertainty. So that is... That is a nice way of saying it's going to happen. You're going to see it, especially if this is a close vote. I think either, either way, I think it, what do you guys think? I think either way, stuff goes down. Let me know. Let me know on the messages there. There is both risk from both the far left anti-government factions as well as the far right militias. Federal authorities also thwarted several white wing terrorist plots across the country in recent months. Okay, from the alleged conspiracy in June to firebomb buildings and Black Lives Matter protests in Las Vegas by three self identified members of the Boogaloo movement. You guys heard of the Boogaloo boys in reference to the electric Boogaloo. The second movie, the first movie was really good. The second movie was terrible. And we're talking about a terrible civil war happening. 2.0. Not good. Boogaloo movement. Uh, to this mo uh, month's arrest of a 14 man linked to two anti government groups that allegedly conspired to kidnap Michigan's governor. All right, did that happen? Allegedly. It probably did. I don't know. I follow that story a little bit, but it got kind of convoluted and I kind of couldn't really figure out what the deal was there. And that seems like that story's just kind of gone, gone by the wayside. Murphy said, in a driving uh, concern, this election has been attempt, uh, attempts to escalate an already tense situation by malignant foreign influences such as Iran, China, and Russia. There we go, Russiagate, who said they are using social media to flare up both sides. I believe that does happen. Like, um, I think there is a major concerted effort to censor a lot of news that is going on. A lot of the guys I follow online, a lot of YouTubers I follow, a lot of the content creators, everybody's talking about, ah, this video will probably get taken down. Yep, this one got demonetized and I've had that happen. I've had to re-edit things, re-upload them, make them more friendly for you guys because you guys have delicate ears. We don't want to hear stuff that, you know, some people don't want us to hear. But my content is routinely getting censored and it's just kind of the way it is right now. And that's why I think people are so worked up about Facebook and Twitter and Google. And Google's what I worry about because Google owns YouTube and uh, that's the platform that, that I work on. So I am trying not to get deplatformed. That's what I'm doing. You gotta walk that fine line of creating the content you wanna create, but then also putting it out there in a way that people can't get too worked up. But if they don't like the content that I have, like I covered the Joe Biden story, um, the release of the New York Post story that got crushed. And that is a lot of what, and I point behind me because that's where the TV is and that's where we watch a lot of our stories here in the, uh, in the um, office, uh, our media room. And on that one, Twitter just outright blocked and Facebook blocked and YouTube blocked basically blocked the Joe Biden, the Hunter Biden um, crack pipe dealings with China, dealings with, um, who was it, Ukraine. They blocked that story because didn't want it coming out and um, they said couldn't be verified. We can't verify this. This is unvetted. Therefore, we're not gonna allow it out there. But if you look at what they have released that hasn't been unvetted, it's just about everything. It's just about everything. So just Wednesday, the Department of Homeland Security and FBI blamed Iran intelligence officials for authoring threatening emails sent to voters from an internet account associated with the Proud Boys. We've got some election interference going on. U.S. Attorney Brian Moran said his office has been coordinating with law enforcement and will, as it has in the past, have a designated election officer on duty, veteran assistant U.S. Attorney Arlen Storm in Tacoma. In the event of questions or problems, you got one guy, man, I don't know. I don't think we send out one guy for anything anymore. And I think whoever you send out for whatever you send them out for, make sure they're armed. Make sure they're armed for their safety because the Looney Tunes running around right now, it's not good. Storm is responsible for overseeing the district's handling of complaints of election fraud and voting rights concerns in consultation with Justice Department headquarters in Washington. 
according to the Depart Department of Justice. There is clearly all sorts of political election mischief that can be out there. Mischief, Moran said. I'm not worried about mischief. I'm worried about the looting, further looting of stores, and that's not just stores, but businesses. Businesses that have been hanging on by a thread because they're in areas that are already, basically, the city has said, yeah, we don't really support our police, and our police know there's a lot of violence in these areas, so the police aren't really doing much in these areas. So you criminals, hall pass, do your thing. Oh, and then if you can prove poverty, mental illness, or what was the other one? Poverty, mental illness, uh, or addiction, um, hall pass. You guys are good. Don't worry about breaking into a store on 3rd Avenue in downtown here in Seattle. You guys are okay. So that is literally what we're dealing with is our local government isn't doing much. People have a hall pass to do crazy stuff. So why wouldn't they go ham right after the election during the counting process or up until um, when the actual victor is declared? I think that's what's going to happen. I think that is exactly what goes on. So that's it for this part of the story. I'm going to take a look at some of your guys' comments here, pick a few, and we'll talk about them and see um, lives over property. Am I right, guys? Uh, it's going to be hell no matter what the turnout. Keep your guns loaded. Outdoors life for style. Uh, and then you guys are kind of ripping on each other, which is fine. I find it really interesting that I do all the talking and then you guys kind of talk. Um, drug addiction is the other. Thank you. Super Lemon. Appreciate it. Uh, check your bug in food pantry now. Got some wild, <laughs> wild comments out here. Most of my comments are pretty amusing every now and then. I had somebody call my office and kind of tear into my secretary. She hung up on him, um, get stuff like that. But it's usually people who just don't really understand what I'm talking about or they just really don't like me. There's a fair amount of that, too. There's people who uh, I've seen comments of, you should, you're a real estate guy. You shouldn't have an opinion. You should be reported. We need to report you to the local real estate board. And my whole thing is, I'm a real estate guy, but I, I also have the constitutional right to share my opinion. And that's what the Seattle Real Estate Podcast is. And my whole thing is, is if you're going to have areas of the country get looted, and we know it's coming, and the National Guard knows it's coming, do we send the feds in? I think we do. We've been talking about that, talked about that this summer. But does it get to that stage? I think it might after the elections. I think either way, I think it might. Hunker down and bake bread from Truth Convoy. Thanks for uh, remote broadcast. Thanks for the more detailed information on the goings on up that way. Very insightful. You are welcome. Yeah, this is, um, you know, Seattle's my, my town, my hometown. I've lived here my whole life. And it is, Seattle's always been a little alternative, a little wonky. Because we're way up here. Even President Trump, he was talking about Chicago and Portland and Philadelphia and all these places that had just the craziness go on. And he forgot Seattle. We always get forgotten. We, we just, we, we're so far northwest, we're full, so far upper left that people forget about us. And that's why I think when the Seahawks have done well, people are like, what? There's no way those guys even have a football team, let alone the 12th man. And I know the 12th man is annoying. It's irritating. It's really loud. Um, but I struggled through the Seahawks just being a terrible football team most of my youth. And um, I don't know. Isn't Seattle in Canada? <laughs> yeah, it just about is. It, you know, our border to the north is literally Canada. Yeah, the same folks who defended police are suing feds for defending Yeah, some people are talking about uh, Michael Putnam. Seattle was the greatest little city, 70s and 80s. And I was here. And it, it, it still is a cool city. We've just got some, some um, civic leaders that are out of their minds. Are you out of your effing mind is what 50 Cent when he said when he uh, saw that his tax rate was going to be 62% in New York City. Thank you, Big, Her Big D Hercules, five bucks. Thank you. 
I appreciate that. It is really weird. Um, and I will try and get to uh, Free King Awesome, 10 bucks. Thank you so much. I'm going to try and figure out how to, I'm, I'm working through memberships right now with the whole live stream and podcast. And I'm a real estate guy. I, I have a little bit of a notion of what I'm doing with the social media here. I have more than that. But this whole live stream thing and the way you guys send in money and super chats, I'm still struggling to get a hold on that because I am um, working my way through business stuff on top of running this podcast. And hopefully at some point in time, I can do this just full time because how much how funny would that be? I mean, let's be honest, it's kind of what I do full time now I do a little bit of work, but both my businesses run pretty well on their own. I come in for some technical stuff. But um, I am not, you know, boots on the ground out there looking at properties every day like I used to be. Linda Lane, thank you so much. Five dollars. Uh, much appreciated. Um, and I, <laughs> I had a funny one the other day. Somebody sent in a message saying to like everybody on the, the I don't, can't remember if it was a live stream, but it was like, oh, look, he's outside. And it was in reference to a podcast. I know a, a video I did in Bellevue. Um, and she was shocked to see me outside. I do go outside. And her concern was for my safety and wealth, welfare and at a protest. But I'm a big boy um, and I can handle myself. But I do appreciate the, um, the well wishes of being safe out there. Most of my career has been outside because guess what? Real estate doesn't happen in the office. You have to get out there and make it go. And especially as a real estate appraiser, you got to be banging on a couple of doors a day inspecting those homes to get paid. So that's most of what I've done is out there in the field. And now I kind of sit back and in order to get these, um, John has legs. Yeah, I do. They're pretty uh, skinny. Um, former runner. I just, I don't, it's really hard to make my legs grow. It doesn't happen. And being that I am 50, I'll be 52 here in a couple of weeks. Um, my testosterone is not what it was at 25. So my ability to grow muscle, I just got skinny legs. That's what we, that's where we go with that. Um, yeah, we're five and one without the 12th man. Go figure. That is so true. Live, laugh, love, lift. That's an awesome name. Yeah. So Seahawks lost their one, lost a tough one last weekend, but, um, you can't win them all, right? I mean, you're going to win some. Let's see what else you guys have. Do you have hairy legs though? No, I don't. I have fine kind of sandy blonde-ish hair. I, I didn't get that hairy. I mean, they're kind of hairy. I don't shave my legs. I'm not a bicyclist. You know, those guys are a bodybuilder who just shaves everything. Uh, more bacon and eggs. Uh, Sawant needs to be arrested and deported. Now well, she's got a recall going right now. Our mayor had a recall going. You guys follow any of that. I mean, it's just the lunacy. Um, remember leg day squats. Yep. Did that yesterday. I am sore sitting down. She's like, Oh, and they turn blonde in the sun. Yep. They do. I kind of go blonde. Uh, I'm 33 and my testosterone was what it was at 25 Hint some missing sod in the breezeway. Yeah. That's kind of, uh, I don't buy the year over 60. Oh, uh, Tacoma is safer than Seattle right now. Probably is. It probably is. That's just kind of kind of the way it goes. All right. So I am going to wrap up mainly because I have got a bunch of other silliness I got to deal with today. It's hump day. Still got a couple of days we, uh, left on the week. And um, real estate here is cranking in Seattle. It's wild. I get people asking me all the time, your property values have to be decimated. And actually, they're not. I'm going to do a podcast. Seattle is second only to Phoenix. I think it's Phoenix and Arizona right now for appreciation. We have the biggest appreciation going on. Who knew? Who figured? But I'm also going to do some videos on uh, how property values around CHOP have been impacted. And they have been impacted. More days on market than um, dollars because there doesn't seem to be anything right now that can stop residential real estate unless you're in a studio or a one bedroom condo in a downtown area that is overrun with the peaceful protesters. All right. So thank you so much to everybody who did the super chat, paid some money. 
I'll be figuring out the membership thing. Uh, my guy, Darian Dunstan, he handles that. I have to kind of wrap my head around it, and then we have decisions to make to how that goes. We're selling stuff. I guess we got some merch. If you want to check that out on our YouTube channel, merch. I'm supposed to say buy some merch, but if you want to, that is awesome. I find it funny when people buy stuff because it's like, why? Why on earth would you buy merch? from a little podcast in Seattle, Washington. I don't know. I guess it's what you do. All right. So thank you so much. Uh, my house is listing tomorrow. All right. Good luck. I hope it sells. Thank you so much for tuning in. Love to have you subscribe. If you haven't, spread the word because this podcast will not, this one won't get demonetized because I'm just kind of covering some milk toast uh, stuff, but I might have a couple between now and election time to get a little, get a little sketchy. So if you guys can, you'll know them when you see them. Um, I might do some, do some investigative work on our Seattle parks here because people are freaking living in our parks. Mark Lehman, thank you so much, 10 bucks. All right, guys, I got to go back to work. Thank you for tuning in. Appreciate it so much. And thanks for being here because if you guys aren't here, I'm talking to a camera and it doesn't go anywhere and I don't feel good about myself then. But I feel good because you guys were here and you guys um, did good live stream. So thanks again. I will catch you on, um, I'm going to live stream. I think I'm going to try and live stream every Wednesday. And if we have something special, like, I don't know, the election, maybe we do a little, maybe do we do a little election night live stream? I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm kind of nervous for the election. You guys, I'll see you then. All right. Peace. Bye.